in memory of Dick Robinson and sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Good afternoon. I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and I am delighted to be here today with Representative Sharice David of Kansas. And I'm excited, especially because I'm a children's librarian. <laughs> And we're here and welcome Congresswoman Davids. Welcome to the 2021 National Book Festival as we're here to talk about your new book for the young and young at heart, Sharice's Big Voice, A Native Kid Becomes a Congresswoman. And welcome to our audience. And you can start submitting your questions now. So can we get started? Because this is the one of the books that I was sharing uh, stories and inspirational things with young people. So you made history in 2018 as one of the first of two Native women elected to the United States Congress. So what? just share with us what that meant to you. Well, first of all, I just, I, I have to tell you how excited I am um, to get the chance to, to be here with you, uh, particularly Dr. Hayden. I think you are an amazing person and inspiration yourself. And so thank you so much for, um, for doing this. And, uh, you know, when uh, then Congresswoman, now Secretary Deb Holland and I got elected in 2018, I think that there was this almost like a collective sense of joy that uh, so many people across the country um, felt because, you know, Native women have been uh, certainly amazing leaders for so long. And uh, to know that it was 2018 and we hadn't seen uh, a Native woman in the U.S. Congress before, um, to get the chance to be part of, of that was, um, it was pretty surreal, actually. And um, I'm just so fortunate and glad to have had the chance to, to be able to, to do this. And, and your book is called Sharice's Big Voice. So you must have had a big voice. So could you tell us about <laughs> that? <laughs> yeah, so it's really, um, I'm really glad I got to, uh, to, to work on this book because in a lot of ways, the name Sharice's Big Voice is um, both an acknowledging and, and honoring of, of two different things. One is that uh, when you read the book, if you haven't already, Dr. Hayden, I know you have, but for the folks who are watching, um, you'll see that I talked a lot, like a lot when I was growing up and, um, you know, sometimes I got in trouble for it, but it also helped me learn a lot of um, skills and um, it helped me learn how to listen actually. And so in some ways, Sharice's big voice is um, an acknowledgement of, of that part of my journey, but also uh, as a, a Ho-Chunk nation uh, tribal citizen, you know, the, the Ho-Chunk language, um, is uh, we're, we're known uh, as uh, people of the sacred voice and, um, and also people of the, the big voice. And so I, I felt like it was a, um, just a really great way to, to honor that and, and be able to share that in a lot of ways with others. Now, you, you said that even though you talked a lot and, and you uh, would sometimes get in a little trouble for it, it also helped you listen. How, how do those two things work? Yeah, you know, I think that um, one of the things I think a lot about, and particularly as I've as I've moved through um, my own path and my own journey, is that um, there are a lot of times where we might feel invisible or um, not seen and and not heard, and I think. Some of that is is when you're speaking, right? Like you have something to say, you want to share something, especially as a child. You know, maybe it's you want to share how you're feeling or ask questions. And um, I think that growing up, I got to see that you can ask questions of other people and and really learn a lot. Um, it's a way to connect. But to be able to do that, you also have to listen to people. Um, and so I think that it it's a way to to help learn how to to not only be seen but to see others and make sure that uh other folks don't feel 
uh, unseen or, or invisible sometimes. Now you also though write about people who, and I think the young people call them doubters, <laughs> who oh. doubted you <laughs> and, and didn't think you'd ever, you know, get elected to Congress and they even doubted you throughout. So there are young people who face that d daily. So do you have any advice for them about how to keep pursuing what you want to do or feeling good about yourself with these doubters and people around you? Yeah, so I think there's something, um, in a lot of ways, there's something universal about um, feeling like you're uh, kind of all alone in this in this experience. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure uh, when I was sharing, you know, my path and my journey was that um, particularly for for young people or or even, you know, when when we're moving through this life, I think a lot of times we might look at others and say, oh man, that person has it figured out, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or grownups have all the answers, they know everything. Um, and, and then you realize as you get older, um, for any of the kids watching, you realize as you get older, um, that's not true. <laughs> you know, we're all just trying yeah. to figure it all out and we're all trying to figure out how to move through this. And um, being able to share that, you know, not only did sometimes, you know, people doubt that I could do, uh, reach my goals or, um, you know, particularly when I ran for Congress, uh, not necessarily believe that I could do it, but also sometimes we doubt ourselves because um, we aren't sure if we have, uh, if we're on the right path, if we're making the, the right choices. And I think that um, it's important for people to see that that you're not alone in that. A lot of us feel that way. And um, that's why I wanted to, to share that piece of, uh, piece of my journey so that other, so maybe some of us can feel a little less uh, lonely in that, in that experience. Right, and it, and it can continue no matter how old you are, there's still that. <laughs> and another thing though, you had one person that you uh, talk about in your book who played an important role that didn't doubt you and was a role model. And that's your mom, your mother. Yeah. Can you talk about her a little bit? Cause it's wonderful to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to, I want to show my favorite picture oh, in the book here in a second, but um, you know, my mom was uh, somehow she is like the, the nicest, and also the toughest person that I know. And, um, you know, she would always like listen to me, even though I talked a lot, um, answer my questions, um, encourage me when I would bring things up and, uh, you know, different ideas that I had. And um, she never told me I, I couldn't do something if I, you know, had some wild idea. Um, she would just, you know, make sure that I was being realistic about it. You know, oh, you want to do that? It's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have to work really hard, you know, and um, and that sort of thing. But she never discouraged me uh, from trying things. And I, I feel like that helped me. Um, it just helped me become a person who is uh, that in martial arts, which I think we'll talk about, um, help me become a person that is, is willing to try things, even if I don't know what the outcome is going to be. And, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to show. Oh, oh we'd love to, because I don't want to move my book and <laughs> want to oh, keep yeah. it right there for everybody can see the cover because the cover is so cool. Yeah. So you could share um, some of it because the illustrations in your book, and you had a wonderful collaboration. Goodness, uh, Josh, so amazing. So, this this picture right here, which is a picture of basically just me talking a whole bunch, and and my mom, like this feels like it embodies what it was like for me as a uh, little you know a little Charisse, just talking and talking and talking, and you know here it's uh, I I when I was young I talked a lot like a lot. You know, I talked to my family and my friends, my friends' families. I talked to neighbors and people shopping in the store, people working in the store. I wanted to know things about people. And, you know, I think that this picture embodies, like, how much my mom just, 
like let me embrace kind of who I was growing up. And, um, and for that, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful because uh, I think sometimes we, you know, we can feel stifled in our um, stifled in our experience and to get the chance to have a mom that, that just really embraced who I was. Do you think that some of that uh, interest in people and she was letting you talk to the people that worked in the grocery store and the people on the way and all that has translated and evolved into your wanting to represent people and be help them and, and you know them? It seems like there's a direct almost line to that. Yeah, I think I definitely think there's um like, I think that's absolutely uh, a, a piece of it for sure. I think it's that, um, you know, learning to connect with people um, at a young age. Uh, and also the fact that my, you know, my mom was in the army uh, when I was growing up. My mom was in the army for 20 years uh, from before I was born until after I got out of high school. And she, because we moved a lot while, you know, while she was getting stationed in different places, I, I ended up making new friends quite a bit. Um, you know, and all of us want to, want to be able to connect with people when we get to a new place. Um, so I learned how to kind of get comfortable with that. And then also just seeing that my mom had a career of service, you know, and when she got done being in the army, she, uh, ended up working at the post office for 20 years. So, you know, my mom has, um, been like, she's dedicated her career to, to service and that has definitely played a role in, um, just my view of how, like how we can help like move things along and, you know, participate my way is by participating in, um, in the government. But I think there are lots of ways that we can be of service to our communities. Well, you, you service with a twist too, because you mentioned the martial arts and I have to tell you, and I hope you can show <laughs> some of the illustrations showing you with your martial arts about three or four pages, just wow. Well, it's so funny. Yeah. So, um, since getting, since starting, this is a very busy job, um, just so everybody knows. And so now I haven't been doing as much uh, martial arts training as kind of your regular working out. Um, but uh, some of that is also because of the, of the pandemic and just trying to, you know, in the okay. same way we're doing this virtual, um, I'm trying to, you know, Right. be as safe as possible but um but absolutely martial arts will be a part of my life for the rest of my life i particularly love brazilian jiu-jitsu for anybody who's watching and also loves <laughs> martial arts um yeah so uh when i was um those action younger, pages wow, yeah look at that i um i got the chance <laughs> I got the chance to start learning a little bit of Taekwondo. And then I started learning Capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial art. And then I started to learn um, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They look and bad. I mean, that's almost an instruct. Don't try this unless you're in class. Yeah. Everybody. Oh, this is not. But and they're then, such cool, cool pictures. And then I got the chance to. So I am. Uh, a person who just loves uh, to loves the process of of learning, and in jujitsu and martial arts, that's um, in a lot of ways. You know, I didn't start really learning martial arts until I was an adult. But in a lot of ways, you have to uh, almost open yourself up to to uh, learning like a child again, because you know you're moving your body in in new ways that you haven't. You haven't ever tried before. Um, you have to you have to be ready to do something over and over and get it wrong. You know, when we are first learning how to walk, uh, we fall over a lot. And so I think that being in that mindset of being willing to try and try and try, and you might not see the the benefit, um, or you won't see exactly what it is you're learning in the moment. But over time, you really get to see that. Um, like all the, like all those steps that you've been taking, just like when you're, when you're a little kid, you know, when you watch, 
when you watch a, a kid that's starting to first walk and then next thing you know, they're running um, and you're running after them. Um, I think that it, it's so interesting to be kind of back in that mindset. And that's what martial arts has brought to my life is a willingness to learn in a way that um, I don't know if I would have had that if I, if I hadn't started learning martial arts. When did you, how, do you remember how old you were when you first got introduced to martial arts and about eight? <laughs> I'm all how? Bruce Lee. Um, uh, so I was obsessed with Bruce Lee when I was growing up. Um, yeah, I must have been about uh, seven or so when seven I, uh, yeah, seven or eight when I first learned um, uh, who Bruce Lee was. And I just remember like just absorbing everything I could about martial arts when I was, when I was growing up. And, um, actually my mom, when she was stationed, um, in Germany, there was a, um, there, one of the other, uh, service members there was teaching a, a Taekwondo class, but then he ended up moving. Um, and so once he moved, there wasn't another martial arts class for me to take. And when we moved back to the United States after she was done in Germany, um, it was just so expensive. And so when I was an adult and I started, you know, working, uh, while I was in college, I, it dawned on me, wait a minute, I can pay for martial arts classes now. And so I started, um, I started taking classes when I was like 19. Wow, that's a lot. Now you you seem to have had a lot of things going on at the same time, and I could <laughs> use some advice on this one too. How do you <laughs> balance that, or do you give yourself a break sometimes and say, you know what, it's okay if it's not like perfect? Yes, that's a really good question. I think that um, there is something about learning how to recognize that things are not going to be perfect um because like we can't we can't be good at every single thing you know and and i think that um it really helped me when i started to see that when i was when i realized you know um like martial arts is a good example actually where uh at different times in my life i was able to dedicate more time to martial arts or, uh, because of things like my work schedule, I wasn't able to dedicate as much time to martial arts and that's okay. Like I want, I would, I remember getting upset with myself sometimes for not, um, going to class as often as I wanted to, or felt like I needed to. Um, but like over time I got to see that, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm learning. Uh, even if I, if I go two times a week, instead of three times a week, I'm still learning. I'm still putting in the effort. And also I'm getting to do something that I love. And now as a member of Congress, I think this is the most busy I've ever been for sure. Um, this and busy. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, even with, uh, I was excited to work on this, um, on this book on Charisse's big voice. Um, but you know, I, I, it took longer than I would have liked, but that's okay. You know, I mean, it, it's, um, it's just important to me that I like one, take care of myself as much as I can, you know, and that's things like getting sleep, um, eating, uh, working out when I can, um, that sort of stuff, spending time with my family, um, and doing those things because, you know, I can't, um, I can't always get all the work done um, right. uh, with unless I unless I do that, you know. And so I think it's I think it's important for us to recognize that like the standard um, can't be perfection with uh, with everything. Yeah, and it's hard. And then you had to be so flexible. And there are some young people that have difficulty making friends and you had to learn how to make friends with moving different places, even different countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's so um, interesting is even, even when I was older, so I didn't, 
it took me eight years to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, I took four years to get my associate's degree and then four years to get my bachelor's degree. Um, and so when I got to law school, I was already, you know, um, 27. And I remember walking around the first couple of days of school and feeling like very awkward, you know, and I think probably a lot of folks know what this feels like when you get to a new place and it feels awkward and you don't really know uh, who, like you kind of scan the room looking for somebody who um, you might be able to go say hi to and, um, or just stand next to. And I remember thinking, you know what? All of us feel this way right now. And so I decided that I was just gonna go and find somebody and try to make sure that they felt welcome. Um, that they felt good about being at this new school. And once I, once I started thinking about how we can help each other feel welcome um, and in the right place, then it helped, it helped me uh, feel mm -hmm. welcome and in the right place. And yeah. so I, I try to remember that when I'm, uh, when I, when I go to new places and also, you know, when I'm, doing things like public speaking. <laughs> well, you've got that voice because questions are coming in now. I want to hear oh. from you. And we have a question coming right away from Julie. Julie wants to know, for kids just getting started on their journey and just thinking about what they want to be when they grow up, do you have any advice for them? Yes. Can I, I'm going to reference my book Go one on. more time. Um, so I don't know if actually, I don't think it's going to be in here. There's one that's not in here that I'll give you after I tell you what this says. Um, uh, this, this page says, uh, everyone's path is different wherever yours takes you. Maybe the lessons I learned along the way can be helpful. Be open to challenges, work hard and you'll learn a lot. Listen to people, but not the doubters. Use your big voice to fight for your beliefs and always remember that you deserve to be seen and heard. So I feel like those lessons that I learned are probably the best um, advice that I could give is, um, you know, things aren't always going to turn out perfectly and they're going to be hard. Um, and, and for some people, things are, you know, there are just, there are obstacles that get in people's way that, um, and some people have more obstacles than others. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, like keep in mind that you deserve to be seen and heard, um, that if you're open to challenges, um, if you, if you're working hard, you're going to be learning the whole time. Um, and then, the piece of advice that I also would give that is not in the book, and I don't know why I didn't, I think it's in the letter. If you read the letter at the end that I wrote, um, take naps. So especially for the young people, like live it up, take all the naps. I know it feels like you're going to miss out on something, but um, probably if you're sitting there with an adult, they're saying, yeah, take the naps. Mm -hmm. um, also, it takes a lot of energy when you're learning to be you and changing the world. Right. Well, more advice. Uh, people really want to hear it because there's a question from Teresa, but she also has a comment. You are such an inspiration for my daughters. Thank you. Okay. And what advice do you have for children who are afraid to use their voices? Oh, yeah. I think that... Um, I don't know if it helps to know this, but um, there are like, you're not the only one who feels um, nervous or, you know, you get that knot in your stomach or sometimes uh, depending, um, sometimes it can be like uh, almost like a little ball in your throat where you want to say something, but you don't know if you should, or you don't know how somebody else is going to react or respond. Um, and it's, and it can be really scary. Um, that happens to me even now. Uh, and I'm, I'm 41. So I think that, um, I hope it helps to know that, 
uh, you're not alone in that experience. And um, m more often than not, people want you uh, to do well and want you to, to be successful and, and want to be supportive. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes saying, I, I'm kind of scared to, to say this, or I'm kind of scared to speak in public, but, um, but I want to try it. And I think you'll be, I think you'll be surprised how many people really, um, like really deep down want you to want you to succeed. Well, Maria has a comment too, and then a question. My daughter checked out your book out of our local library and didn't want to return it because she loved it so much. I can oh. relate to that. I had one too. Did libraries play a role in your childhood? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, actually, I think one of the conversations that, um, so Nancy, Nancy K. Mays, who's uh, the co-author here, one of the uh, really interesting things about writing a, writing a children's book is that I realized how um, little I read when I was growing up. And, um, and then I found out, which I, I didn't know before this, but I found out while we were, um, you know, talking about me writing a children's book is that there's only like native um, characters only represent one one percent of the characters right. in in native. Uh, I'm sorry, in children's books, and right. you know, I think that I can't say for certain, um, but I I might have spent a little bit more time connecting with books um, if I had had like kind of a wider variety of, of books growing yes. up. I don't know that for sure, um, but now that we're seeing a lot more, um, a lot bigger variety of books, I'm, I'm hoping that that's the case. Um, but I didn't, I didn't spend as much time in the library growing up as um, my my current self uh, probably right. would like to. <laughs> well, Congresswoman, I'm so glad that Maria asked that question and you had that answer because I, you, I hope that you plan to write more books and share it because books can be windows to the world, but they also need to be mirrors. And if we say books are so important and you never see yourself in a book, that's sending a, a message too. So thank you for letting young people see themselves because the last question is from Hannah, who says, what's your advice to women of color in white spaces who feel discouraged, and this could be women and children, mm -hmm. from expressing their voice, being the only person of color and reluctant to speak up. Yeah, man, that's hard um, to be in that to be in that spot. And I think there's probably, you know, there's probably a lot of folks um, who are uh, watching who know what it's like to be the only, um, and I'm sure both of us, uh, you know, we, yeah. knowing what it's like to be the only person uh, with your experience in a room um, can be really, really hard. It, it feels lonely and isolating um, and can sometimes feel disempowering, um, but it also sometimes can feel empowering. And I think that um, for me, one of the things that I, that I do when I, when I feel um, that twinge of doubt you know, it's, uh, it's something that sneaks up on you. Like, should I say something? Do I ask a question? Do I make my point? Um, like that sort of thing. Um, like I try to look at it as, uh, I'm, I have the opportunity to share a perspective that other people m might never have thought of. And that's really powerful. Um, you get to be the person in the room who's an expert on something um, that no one else is an expert on. And you get to share stuff that no one else might have thought of before. And that is so valuable. Um, and, and you should know that that's valuable, uh, even if the other people in the room might not recognize the value in it in, in that moment. 
Well, Congresswoman Davids, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to your readers. You see, you've got a fan base already. <laughs> because with your book, you've helped uh, inspire young people and older people, too, to overcome obstacles and become who they want to be. So then thank you to the audience. We had many more great questions, and I wish we had time for them. And yes, everyone, thank you for being part of the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. And you've been listening to Representative Sharice Davis of Kansas talk about her new book, Sharice's Big Voice, A Native Kid Becomes a Congresswoman. Thanks to our audience, yay! <laughs> and please continue to enjoy the festival. Thanks everybody.